You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. Welcome to Convenience Matters. My name is Jeff Leonard. I'm with Nax. And what we talk about on Convenience Matters are things that matter to convenience stores. And if they matter to convenience stores, they matter to about half the U.S. population that comes to a convenience store every single day. And I'm Carolyn Schneer with Nax. And those 160,000 people visiting us every day, we keep them filled with fuel, food, and most importantly, time. And one of the things that we spend a lot of time as uh, in industry is we talk about numbers. And today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about not just our industry, but we're going to talk about supermarket club, dollar, uh, basically that, that roughly $1 trillion nut, where the, where the sales have been going, where they have gone, and where they are going. And we have the expert that will take us through all of that. So today, we'd like to welcome Todd Hale. Todd Hale is a former executive with Nielsen. He is now a consultant to Nielsen and a number of other businesses. And pretty much over the last few decades has been the expert on the industries, uh, the food and grocery industries that comprise roughly $1 billion, $1 trillion in sales. So welcome, Todd. Thank you, Jeff. And we are at the SOI Summit, the next day of the industry summit, and one of the things, we look at our numbers, and we're about, our industry sales are close to a uh, 200, they're over 200 plus billion dollars. Uh, And of course, you have all these other channels that make up much more. Your presentation today was looking at, uh, let's, let's, it's okay to look in the rearview mirror, but we really need to look ahead. What are the big trends that you see looking ahead for these industries, whether it's convenience or grocery or dollar or drug? Well, I'd say, uh, number one, uh, e-commerce has to be the, the biggest threat to everyone. It's not the biggest sales driver today, but it's the biggest driver of growth. Uh, number two would have to be uh, health and wellness, um, but I also add that uh, you know indulgence really, really matters too. Uh, good tasting desserts, good tasting foods are driving strong success today. Um, but when you look across wellness claims as measured by Nielsen, without question, organic, natural, gluten-free, um, non-GMO, doing exceptionally well and double driving double-digit growth. But there's a lot of small claims, a lot of ancient grains that are you know, driving 100% increases year over year, but they're very small in terms of sales. So e-commerce, health and wellness, indulgence. Um, you know, this whole multicultural shift in our population, we've never been more diverse in this country. So who's winning today are a lot of niche companies, particularly on the branded side, who have figured out a way to connect with shoppers, unique shoppers with unique products. And it's, it's been a struggle for the big, fast-moving consumer goods companies to keep up with them and their innovation. So their growth has slowed, while those that have been able to connect with niche have been able to drive growth. So, Carolyn, uh, we have been, uh, in particular, as part of the Refresh Initiative, we've been focusing a lot on fresh and what's going on with fresh. And, and I know there were five major trends uh, that, that you illuminated in your presentation. Let's start with the first of those, um, the demand for fresh. Uh, Carolyn and I have been very involved in looking at the numbers and seeing where things are going. What are one or two points that you see related to fresh that convenience stores need to pay attention to? Well, if fresh produce, uh, vegetables, and fruit, I think, are the first opportunity, and you see that already. Um, but I think this whole value-add movement that a lot of grocery stores have brought to the industry and in saying that, you know, if we pre-slice, if we pre-cut, uh, you see corn on the cob in supermarkets where they've actually taken off the cob. And in some cases, not all the cob, but part of the cob, uh, as a way to drive convenience, but also at a premium price. Uh, when you think about being able to charge more for corn on the cob that has a little less cob on it, it well, <laughs> seems like it wouldn't work, but it's working. It's convenient. Right. It's right. in the name. And and you get to see the product, too. So you don't have to peel back, <laughs> if you will. Yeah, right. and we've done uh, consumer surveys where we look at when you buy a meal, what do you do with that meal in a convenience store? And, and about 10% eat the meal uh, at the store because they have seating. Mm -hmm. About 20% eat it upon their destination, but most of them eat it in the car. So what's really good to hear, well, first off, I think value added has a lot of potential. If it fits in a cup holder, that is the future with our industry because they're eating in the car. And I'm delighted to hear that they're not eating corn on the cob while driving. (laughs) So 
That is a I've good seen thing. Worse. But yes. I think a, lot, a number of the chains do a pretty good uh, dinner business these days too, right? So driving home to pick up a meal from a convenience store and having uh, you know healthy produce uh, along with it to take home the snack or include in that meal. Uh, we talked about meal kits today too. When you think about the growth in um, Blue Apron and Plated, um, you know people willing to spend extra a premium to have products sent to them that they can slice up and cook their own meals based on the ingredients that are provided to them. Uh, those trends are also working. It's fresh. It, it appears to be fresher to consumers, and it's also helping grocery stores create their own version of that where you can pick it up in store and take it home. Or in the case of Ahold, you can also order online and have Peapon delivered to your home. So I think that's a space where convenience stores could play as well because uh, there are going to be some of their shoppers who would like to get a little more engaged in the preparation meal and others not. And Jeff and I discussed it's it's more it's environmentally friendly now. You don't have to ship it across in a plane and an airplane with your gas and there's no driving of this by the delivery vehicle and everything else. Right. You go there, there's less packaging. Yeah, I think it's a really nice fit for our industry because it is convenience. Yes. That's a great point to bring up about the sustainability and environmentally because I talked about I tried Amazon's uh, beer and wine uh, two-hour two hour delivery service, which is really a two-hour delivery window. It's a little bit misleading, but I was kind of surprised that the packaging, I bought, so we bought two six-packs of beer and a 12-pack of beer. Both six-packs were wrapped in sort of that aluminum stay fresh and each had their own block of ice packed in plastic to keep it cold. So it was ice cold. But we got it, you know, four hours and two minutes after we thought we were going <laughs> to, you know, get it. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe it's so yeah. that, you know, when it gets delivered by drone, it doesn't hit the ground and smash to pieces, too. Right. So maybe it's like a, like a cushioning, too. Right. right. <laughs> well, uh, so fresh, obviously, big trend. But it doesn't have to necessarily be tr fresh to get credit for the freshness, for the, the idea of... of transparency right. and, and having clear packaging right. and clear labeling and that that can also mean indulgent and that was one of the other tr that was the second trend that you really uh, hit upon you look at screaming sicilian pizza in the frozen pizza aisle in supermarkets you can see through the package and so you see the ingredients and it has that appearance of being fresh they've also connect with shoppers digitally you can actually play a video game on their app while your pizza's cooking and i you know that's aligned so well with the kind of consumer mm. who shops at convenience store um but without question what what campbell is doing with see-through packaging um to give that appearance of fresher i think is is an area where i think convenience stories with their food and beverage offerings could benefit from as well and, but i do question this whole free from movement you know, once we get all these artificial ingredients, artificial colors out, well, okay, but it's like everybody can do that. It's, it's what you do beyond that. How do you create products that really deliver taste and value or convenience, whatever the case might be? When you, you mentioned indulgence, too, I think that's one thing that we do offer in convenience store, which is choice. Right. I mean, if you want the candy bar, please have the candy bar. You know, if you want the fried chicken, go for it. If you like vegan food, then we have that, too. And I think that... Um, you can touch it, you can see it, it's right there, and you. it, it plays back to the indulgence. It gives you that extra treat, that extra, you're, you're treating yourself. Or You, you take a cue from um, you know retailers like um, Wegmans or Dorothy Lane Market, it's a small chain in, in the Dayton area, that they sell um, quite a bit of indulgent um, dessert items, um, killer brownies, uh, some really high-end chocolate desserts that look absolutely fantastic um, that, that are doing really, really well because we do like to take a time out. And, of course, every woman I know, my wife, knows that if you eat dark chocolate, it enhances your health, your brain health. It's your very, heart. very healthy. Yes. You should eat it in large quantities. <laughs> that and red wine, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, both it of them. Keeps the ticker going. Yeah. Right. right. Which actually brings us to um, your next point, which was experience and, and, and just even seeing that, that, oh my gosh, now I'm so hungry and thirsty a little bit too, but um, that <laughs> you, you see that beautiful chocolate cake and it's, it's like that experience you home, you're like, oh my God, I went to this great bakery and it was actually a gas station. Yes, and you, but it's the smell. So the sensor of being able to smell that product being baked fresh or warmed up fresh is, um, you know, Mariano's in, in uh, Chicago makes it a point on their website of talking about we have products baking fresh daily because they want that aromatherapy to help them drive demand while consumers are in their stores. 
Um, so I, I think a great way to do that. And it's worked for a lot of the QSRs, whether it's Jimmy John's or Subway. Uh, there's a big point about you walk into the store and you will smell the bread, and that's part of the experience. And uh, you you also talked about the experiences is how traditional QSRs look much different. Like McDonald's does not look like the traditional McDonald's with the McCafes or some of these other um, QSRs. They really look like sit-down restaurants. Go into an Arby's, go into a, a KFC, uh, go into a Taco Bell, and the, and the new versions of them, they're, they're pretty incredible. And also, this whole thing that I think Chipotle brought, up, brought us, that you, consumers waiting to stay in line to watch a meal customized for them, could be an opportunity. Well, you do it with deli sandwiches in C-stores now. But Talk there, about fresh. Yes. But how do you do that? And you see these uh, new pizza offerings, Blaze, and uh, where you watch your pizza being made um, sort of in, a, in an assembly line. Um, <clears throat> is there an opportunity to, to add that to the industry as well? You know, I, that brings me to something I think about and, and I, I really enjoy is on um, e-commerce. In the Domino's, you have the app and it tells you exactly who's making your pizza, where you are in the process. You're like, oh, where is it? You know, you can look, oh, wait, you know, Francisco's making it right now. Now it's in the oven. It's so exciting. So that brings up a great point about the experience because because it's not just indoors, inside the store, but how do you, how do you enhance the experience when people are not in your stores? Mm -hmm. So through your apps, through your communication to them. And, and I would not give up opportunities around direct to um, consumer marketing materials. Um, I, one of the things I think Kroger does very well is they mine their loyalty card data. And I get, and my wife and I get communications based on what we buy in their stores. Um, they don't try to get us to buy stuff we don't buy, but they do a very good job of, of direct that information to us, to our home. So we feel good about Kroger's watching over us. and. To the extent that C stores can mine their data, mine their loyalty cards if they have them, uh, to connect with shoppers both outside of the store and inside the store, give them a reason to come back more often. I think is the the real challenge, and particularly in this whole e-commerce world and click and collect and delivery to homes and and how do you how do you take advantage of the fact that a store can be a very meaningful experience. And Carolyn, you mentioned Domino's, and that was one of the things that, Todd, you focused on in your presentation. You looked at the various QSRs, who's doing well, who isn't, and Tom, Domino's was at the top of the list with about, I think, 11% sales lift. 11% same-store sales growth over the last 52 weeks. It's, it's just phenomenal. But if you look at how they connect, you can order a pizza through a tweet, uh, through a mobile app. Through Alexa. Uh, yes, through yeah. Alexa. Uh, without having to be, I think that may be one of the changes where you don't have to have the Domino's account. Somehow they they figured out how to bypass some of the how you sign up for the account, and uh, and now they're offering uh, delivery through robots in Germany and the Netherlands is coming this summer as well, where <laughs> these little what looks like little coolers roll through urban towns and go up to your door and you open up the cooler and there's your fresh pizza. So. And, uh, of course, uh, Pizza Hut, can, you can order sh uh, pizza via your shoes, right? If you watch those <laughs> NCAA just commercials. Just click your heels right. and look, it's pepperoni. But, but on Fresh, uh, uh, Papa John just came out. They're going to look at adding organic uh, produce in their pizzas. You know, they've already talked about fresh ingredients. Now, it, millennials do uh, over-index to organics, so it's an interesting play, but... <laughs> I don't know who thinks that eating a pizza is going to make you live longer and last, you know, um, and healthy. But uh, I, know a I think it's people. more of an, <laughs> yeah, it's an <laughs> indulgent thing that we certainly take advantage of a lot. And and I, going to your fourth point, you talked about e-commerce. And now e-commerce, I, I think most people, you almost can't have a conversation without talking about Amazon. And but you also talked about threats and opportunities. And e-commerce also can be a significant opportunity for convenience stores. Uh, yes, when you look at uh, the fact that uh, you know McDonald's is going to be or offering online order and pick up at store or delivery to home by by the end of the year, that's what they're claiming. And you, but you've got services out there like Shipped, you've got services out there like Instacart, Uber Eats, um, Amazon's doing it as well, where you can um, collaborate with third parties to help you facilitate e-commerce in some interesting ways that. You don't necessarily have to spend a lot, but at least you're providing that offering. You don't have to build the infrastructure of delivery vehicles if you can leverage services that are out there. So, Todd, you and I have known each other for, gosh, a, a decade on and off coming to our, our events and whatnot. So, thinking back, go back, you know, whatever uh, 10 years ago was, you made some great predictions. You're, you're, you're basically a futurist. 
So if you can think back, what were, can you even come up with one of those things that you came up with that either came true or was so crazy that you're glad never came true or that? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I did a few years ago predict Amazon success based on their history. So what's going to be interesting now, though, if you look at their historic trend in sales and project out over the next five years, they could add $242 billion in sales to what they've already done. They could grow as much as Costco and Kroger sell today which is a staggering number. But the question is, are they going to be able to do that? Are they at a point where they've got so much competition now? Because Walmart's investing in it, Target's investing in it, you know, Wawa Sheets, you know, 7-Eleven. Are they going to start slowing down? Are we going to see sort of that curve still grow, but not as fast as it has historically and, and therefore um, create some challenges for them? So is the challenge with e-commerce, do you need to react to what they're doing? Or can you just look at what they're doing and say, that works for me, I'm going to steal that idea? Yeah, great question. I, you know, I, I think you have to be unique um, and you have to, to create something that your organization can pull together that's important to your shoppers. So not everybody should have an Amazon Echo in, in their stores. <laughs> right, right. But, but technology is a big part of it. Use, leveraging your mobile apps has got to be a big part of what C-Stores do. And they've done some great innovation with, with uh, mobile apps. I, I forget there's a small Pennsylvania C-Store chain um, that I've seen the CEO present here in the past that did some very interesting work with apps four or five years ago. So it's, it's certainly not new to this industry. Yeah, I was, um, I was in a, uh, a Radio Shack the other day, and, and they're, they're closing. Or the one I was in was, right. was getting ready to close, and the, the guy that worked there was just, you know, I'll find something to do after this. He goes, I've seen people walk in, take a picture of what's there, order it on Amazon right in front of me after we've talked it through, and then they leave. He's like, that's, that's right there. There's one example of trying to keep up, and it's just not working. So I think it's, it's a great thing that we're, you have to differentiate yourself. You just you really have to be special and you have to be a destination and you have to to really help yourself with that. Right. But I wonder if too if an opportunity for C stores and I didn't talk about it today is are there opportunities to offer um, e commerce purchases of products that aren't in your stores? So could you through your mobile app um, target your shoppers with hey, we've got some great opportunities because we've got to purchase a number of TV sets or phones or whatever in case, but for you to sell them to your shoppers uh, and get a good value because you're able to do some, some good buys around those products. You know, not a wide array of products, but is there a way to, to broaden what you sell and with what's happened to cigarettes, what's happened to the gasoline? How do you continue to build sales in your stores beyond what's in the box today? And I've seen a couple examples of that. There's one retailer who uh, he has digital displays, but he also uses those TVs to sell to the customers, mm -hmm. and particularly around Christmas time. And another example, another channel, um, they had a local school just do pictures, uh, sixth grade or something like that. They drew pictures. They put them on the, all, on the wall uh, at, by one of the exits. You could buy one of those pictures for $10. Um, I'm sure the parents would buy those pictures <laughs> or, or grandparents or friends right, or something right. like that. But you're doing a couple things and, and you're really addressing your last point, the niche marketing and appealing to everybody. And, and how do you find something in the community? How do you reach out to ethnic groups, to Hispanics and, and these various groups that, that don't want to be marketed like everybody else? Mm -hmm. Right, right. So it's, it's just about finding out what makes people enthusiastic about your store. Uh, one of the interesting things about all the pizza guys, too, you can order online or call on the phone in Spanish, too. So uh, having Spanish language as an option is something those guys have done a very good job of offering up. I'm certainly hungry now. Yeah. <laughs> so I wasn't before. Getting to uh, Carolyn's question a little bit ago, what predictions from the last 10, 15 years were you most proud of? Since we're now on tape now and on the record, Throw out one prediction that we can look back five years from now and say, bingo, I should have paid more attention. Well, uh, it, it's, it's the shrinkage in stores that I think is going to be absolutely dramatic. Um, and not just in our industry. You look what's happening in the banking industry and how e-commerce and digital. Uh, I read an article recently about a bank is going to offer tellerless, peopleless banks but still have... It's not uh, an ATM. <laughs> no, but it also has a meeting room that if you want to talk to somebody, they have a television screen where you can so do an interview for a loan in a location that doesn't have people. Now, I know there's been some convenience stores that have experimented with peopleless C-stores, 
Um, but, you know, I digress. But we're getting back to, I think, store closing, store openings, it's just going to be amazing. We're already seeing, and I brought up in the presentation today, uh, office supply stores, department stores, and electronic stores have been the three areas that have seen the most store closures um, to the tune of 700 stores in the, in the last three quarters that have been announced. Um, I think we're going to see that just ramp up in a big way. Um, Kroger's already pulling back on their new store openings this year. Uh, Target's done it. Walmart's done it. Um, and so we're going to see some real estate that's going to be available. <laughs> Uh, and it's going to create some challenges. If, if you've got a big box retailer that you uh, rely on for a draw of traffic to your C-store, you got to think about, where do I move? If, if that I no longer have that drawing power, can I stay there or do I move? So it's going to create some interesting challenges in terms of how the industry responds to these closings. Do they take advantage of it and open a spot there, or do they have to move to go where the traffic is? So it sounds like the big message is it's not about the store count, but it's about making the stores you have count. You betcha. Yeah. Well, thank you, Todd. Thank Thank you for listening to Convenience Matters. You've been listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by NACS. For more information, go to naxonline.com.